on the screens one of the one of the practices that has been shared on the on the website um, the, for people to go in to go and access and go and use and um, obviously it's got players sort of locked into areas so if I, if I come over to you Sam linking to some of the stuff you've just said around space or around practice design what would be some of the considerations you would think about consider in this sort of practice design space in terms of players in boxes and in areas what sort of considerations could you use and what sort of things could you use this for um, yeah, I think looking at looking at practice is very much sort of ball mastery and dribbling. And I think go back to exactly what Cara and um, Steve have just alluded to is how can you how can you keep these sort of fun? And and I think one thing that kids sort of thrive off is is the competitive side of it. So I look at that practice and the first thing that I think of as a coach, how can we make this fun, engaging, and make it competitive for the kids? So, where, and again, it goes back to recognising like spaces and things. So, whether you have a trigger player that the minute they dribble out, can the next player recognise that then they go into that space? Um, whether it's timed stuff where you can put a little competition on it and you have points for the winner. Um, I think, like I say, I think for me, one of the most important things over the next sort of coming weeks that, that we're in this process, it's got to be how do we keep the, the kids engaged? Um, and with, with the fun competitive element and again I think that comes down to to you as a coach going back to that planning going there's a very simple sort of um, structure there if you like or session plan that, that's really easy that you can pull off but how can you put your own spin on it and how are you going to get your five kids going away from that going wow that 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 was that was a really good session um, I think there's some other sessions on there around shooting we, it, you, you'll never take that away from kids that they just love love the shooting element, um, whether it just be them and the goalkeeper or whatever, but just adding that competitiveness, um, I think is going to be key to keeping your kids engaged um, going mm. forwards over the next few weeks. Yeah, brilliant. So some of them individual challenges, knowing your players and the competition element to linking. Graham, Steve, anything to add on this last what? bit? You know, I this is, love, love, love what Sam said, Andy, and, and, and totally agree. The, the one thing I thought in there, Sam, as well, which I know some of the uh, some of the some of the boys and girls I've worked with, is what, once they get a little bit of practice of that, then maybe introduce different ball sizes. Sam, maybe even a tennis ball, really challenge them and challenge their thinking and give them a, 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 a maybe a different contextual experience of, of ball manipulation. Um, to be creative, Andy. You know, to bring it to life. Yeah, and I think they've got an opportunity to come up with some of their own stuff as well. So absolutely, or challenge the mate. So you give your mate yeah. a challenge. You so Steve, I'll give you a challenge of how many headers you can do, or you can give me a challenge mm -hmm. of yeah. whatever. So I think it's that. It's, it, I think it's keeping the kids stimulated in, in the session that you've got, where you've taken the, the game they love, in essence, away from them at the minute. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think. I think. I think we're both finding it is vital. So uh, Steve's point of. Um, using our imagination as coaches to think about how can we challenge the players differently within the constraints that, that we've got in terms of the way we practice, design practice. So it might be that we frame it in different ways around different different equipment. It might be that diff um, that's a great way, as, as Steve said. It might be just challenging the players to find different ways themselves. So in, in, a, in, a, in a dribbling practice such as this, it might be the way they dribble, might be the types of touches, the surfaces of the foot they use, the different combinations of that. It might be the sizes of touch. It might be the changes of direction once they go in and out of the, the square and the changes of speed. There's lots of little things we can try and challenge. But really trying to tap into a Sam says so vitally around seeing what they can come up with and, and really tap in into to the players themselves. So one one overriding important thing is trying to keep this like a, a feeling of playfulness um in the thinking and imagination really using imagination so this might sound a bit out there and it depends on the age of the kids but really tapping into the kids' world and the, in their imagination and what might make sense to them because kids have got great imagination haven't they so we can tap into that um even imagining defender sometimes you don't need it just imagine there's a defender there what are you going to do? Or just like really, I know I might be pushing, it might not always work, but I think it's just being prepared to to be playful with it um, and, and and modeling that a bit ourselves and being being prepared for, for the kids because it really tapping into their imagination and their own ideas. I think another, another thing with that is um, zones can be really 
you can use them in lots of different ways. So I know this is this is a dribbling session, but you you could um, you could do various things around like timing of runs into a square, with that, maybe without the ball. To um, different ways of doing that, um, and like passes that arrive at the same time as somebody else. Um, do you know what I mean? So so you're still maintaining distances really importantly, but. Um, yeah, how can you can you play a pass to meet the run? Can you do that in different ways? Can you uh, move to the ball in different way? Whatever. So using the squares can be a great way of of doing that. And over the weeks or whatever, even the size of the square that you have for something like that would change the target and change the challenge. So if you're trying to leave a leave a pass for somebody else to arrive and there's a smaller square, it's probably more challenging to get the weight of the pass right and the timing of the run. So all these little things of like this is one session template, if you like which you can use in lots of different ways with a bit of imagination. And um, yeah, I think so that playful idea of tapping in to your own imagination and the kids is, is vital. Yeah. And I think the, the practices were put together with that structure bit in mind, as you've just said, more than the content. So I think that's really important when, when coaches then start getting back on the grass with the players, that then they do start sharing as well of things that have worked and different things that they've done with the practices as you as we've just alluded to as a four, there's probably 10 or 12 different things we've just discussed in some way within that one practice design. So I think that's really important that then we encourage people to share that and we'll continue to try and share practices as we as we go through and adapt things that we can adapt during practices to get different returns on stuff. I feel, yeah, I agree with that. I think I, even I'm just looking at that, that practice as a coach now. You know, when you, you sort of your head starts to spin and I think for any sort of coaches watching this, I'd really encourage people to take that as, as a sort of safety, a, a good structure and go, how many different practices can you come up with from that? Because there's some great passive practices that are just screaming at me from that. And yeah, it's a, it's a that, that's clearly like a dribbling one. So I think if you get your framework right and you get two or three basic frameworks and structures with uh, obviously adhering to the guidelines and then that's your job as a coach to then be creative with that of, of how many different sort of sessions and, and what it can look like differently. Yeah. And when you think about, when you think about core skills, um, that you might be able to practice within this, there might be some real ball control skills that you can do. It might be even ways of juggling the ball. So you, you might have things like that where it's real ball control and different ways of, of, uh, manipulating, moving, controlling the ball. So those, those ball control skills might be a great focus for the individuals within the session. The other individual focuses might be um, like tra traveling skills, ways of dribbling, ways of running with the ball out your feet a little bit more, um, ways of dragging the ball. So all those types of skills I've just mentioned, when when we talk about staying on the ball, and Pete Sturgis talks so passionately about staying on the ball, there's some of the skills that you need to be able to stay on the ball yeah, and that absolutely. the players will need once to try and stay on the ball when they're back playing whenever we get back to, to, to playing against people. Um, so just thinking about what might be some of the skills that the that the player, each individual might need, which will actually, it is to transfer back into their, their game later, or it might be um, receiving skills, so like ball control linked to when the ball arrives, how do you take the ball? So it might be some technical things around different parts of the feet, different body shapes, um, taking the ball across your body, um, you might try and have try and receive bouncing balls because that's, that's actually really really hard to to control to smooth to smooth your touch out. So even within this, you can almost pitch it different challenge points for the players by the task we set. Yeah. Uh, so the young, the real youngest players, just getting the ball into the spell in any way is, is really is a challenge for the moving ball. So just getting in line with the ball and taking the ball where they're gonna go next. That might be a great start point around where you might start with like receiving. And, and control um, or you might get into scanning checking your shoulder um, the coach might be somewhere else with a, with different colors and, and it's it's not it's not ideal because you haven't got the pictures that players would see in the game but you've got something for them to look at as well as looking at the ball um, all these little things or you could even then get to um, like you say the moving bit of it of trying to move to the ball move into the space where the ball's going to arrive because that's really hard to get right but that's vital for midfielders and strikers and wingers when you're playing and those connections between people to so even that you can you can help players learn a bit of that um or and, and with the connections maybe the passing of like you said before different types of passes different ways to pass trying to leave passes in in areas for to meet somebody's run um or maybe different angles of passes all these things if you just 
really clever. You can actually picture the different different places depending on the players that, that you've got. But all they are just sort of core skills, but can then link in and help players. Although it's not ideal, they, they, they might have a chance of transferring some of those things if you use your imagination back in when they do have defenders and the normal pictures to use and play against. I think there's a bit before that as well, though, Car as well, isn't it? You know, with, without the ball, some some of the fundamental movements, opportunities to really get kids moving from space to space and sort of in different ways and having a race who can get into the the, the, the free square first and just revisiting and, and not forgetting about some of the, the challenges that the kids might have had for however long they've been in, in, in lockdown um, of just some of that fundamental stuff that, that, that is so important before they even get a ball at the feet. I thought, I thought the same, Sam. That, that, that it could actually be an arrival activity uh, it, to, to just start up gently and build it. Yeah, I thought exactly the same. And how much we've talked about one practice, and that's that's even without the benefit, Graham, of of actually bringing it to life and then going reflecting on it. As Sam talked about plan, do, review, reflecting, and and also you know building in a little bit of time to to talk to your players and to to to, to ask them what what. what 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 did they really enjoy? What did they learn from it? What did they take away from it? What would they like to see added or taken away, increased or decreased? So 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 much um, opportunities just within one practice. And from a, from a coaching perspective as well, it's probably something that people have been craving for a long time: is the opportunity to have half the group there and less players. So the opportunity to actually focus in on some of your players that are in front of you, rather than having 10, 12, 14, 16, being able to really zoom in on five players is going to allow you to observe a lot more about that individual, to be able to do what you've all said really around tailoring tailoring the practices to suit them better. 